I'm Sean Mine, and I, I welcome you to the second international workshop on smart grid design implementation. And um, I, I thank uh, Paul DeMartini, who couldn't make it here today, and also um, David Sappington for, uh, for helping out with all this. And, uh, and um, uh, so um, I just have a few words. I don't want to waste too much time before we get started. Um, my, my, my personal interest in all of this is uh, to push along for renewable energy. So that's, that's my own, own, own interest. I'd like to move a lot faster in getting, like it, we're, here we are in the Sunshine State with, what, 2% uh, solar energy or something, at most. Uh, <laughs> and I'd like to accelerate that process. And it creates all sorts of exciting engineering challenges as well as economic. Um, so that's basically the, the goal of the meeting personally. I know that everybody has their own agenda. Um, a lot of academics just want to get funding and, uh, <laughs> and uh, utility companies would love to see restructuring of the, uh, of the whole um, rate system so they could actually make money <laughs> and actually be a bit more creative as well. Um, and uh, so it, that, that, that's one part of the meeting as well is to find out what people really care about and to help uh, um, you know, both, uh, well, to help in, inform the government and policy and also help academics to figure out which re research directions they should really follow. Um, I, I have, to have to take this opportunity to, to uh, do a little bit of advertising. So uh, with, I want to say a few words about uh, energy in Florida. So first of all, I want to mention this is Florida Institute for Sustainable Energy that's been uh, started about 10 years ago and involves about 150 uh, professors at the University of Florida uh, all, con all concerned with the issues I'm talking about, trying to um, uh, see how to advance uh, renewable energy, whatever that means, and uh, foster collaboration among uh, academics here, which is really difficult in the energy sector. It's very hard to get two people in energy to talk to each other. <laughs> it's try you know, because people you know, they have completely different uh, views of what energy is about. <laughs> uh, p you know, the power systems versus nuclear engineering, versus somebody's interest in algae for power. Um, so anyway, that's been uh, funded by the state, and uh, it's. And I've recently agreed to become the director. That's that's uh, <laughs> a bit of a challenge. And underneath that is the. Um, I mean, above that is the Florida uh, Energy Systems Consortium, which is uh, involves all the universities in Florida, and involves. I mean, I can't even go th begin to discuss all the projects that are going on. Um, a lot of it, you know, like I mentioned, biofuel systems, nuclear engineering, you know, and so there's a lot of energy activity in Florida. And I forgot to say the College of Engineering here is hiring. So there'll be at least four new uh, faculty in power uh, hired this year. And so th things are you know, moving in, in the right direction at, at Florida. And that's definitely needed because undergraduates are screaming here that they want uh, power courses and, and, and they'd like to do research in power. Okay, so again, so the goals of the research are basically, I want to repeat this again, is how do we prepare for a rapidly changing energy mix? Uh, We've, we, we know how hard that is. So, so we know that in Germany, when they thought they could just plop down all this wind and solar, they've seen chaos. And in the Pacific Northwest, the same thing. They've plopped down all this wind. There, four gigawatts seemed like a lot to me in the Pacific Northwest. It's 40 gigawatts of wind in Germany. And it's an incredible chaos to deal with this. But I think we can do it. It just takes a bit of engineering. Um, and the biggest thing is volatility there. But how to engage consumers is something that uh, we need to discuss. So that's a, that's a big a big part of the to me a big part of the uh, goal of the workshop as well is that there's a, a notion of of solving these problems through economics, engaging consumers. We hear uh, prices to devices screamed all the time. What that means is something we all need to talk about together. Because it, it's, uh, we can make we consumers very angry with prices to devices. We can destabilize the grid, or we can make things work better. So that's that's a big, a, a, at least it's a big personal interest of mine. And then all again, after all of this, there should be some energy policy in the U.S. <laughs> to move us in the right direction. And hopefully, after some discussion, we can uh, create an energy policy. So that's that's, that's really the, the grand goals of the workshop. Hopefully, we can do all that in in two days. <laughs> Who better to start off the workshop? <laughs> um, is this the first one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Then, then uh, Buck Martinez from Florida Power and Light, um, um, and uh, who's the senior uh, director of project development for Florida Power and Light, uh, who joined in 1981. So uh, yeah, <laughs> so you can really give the history of the uh, 
uh, history of, of energy in Florida. FPL, we're actually part of a holding company. The holding company is called Nextera. And we've got subsidiaries, Nextera Energy Resources, which we call NEAR, and then we've got FPL. In the state of Florida, we're the largest utility. We, we make up about 52% of, of all the customers in the state of Florida, 4.7 million customers. And then Nextera Energy Resources, we're probably, I think we are the largest renewable energy company in the United States. Um, one of the things that's interesting for us is over the last five, six years, we know we've had a pretty significant challenge on the economy, but we have invested over $31 billion in infrastructure in the last few years. It's a lot of money. Um, when you look at GE and some of the other major capital investment companies, I think we rank second in, in capital investment. So part of the, uh, what I really want to talk about, part of that is not only are, are we investing capital, what we've been able to do is reduce the rates of our customers in the state of Florida to rates that, were ch that are cheaper today than they were 10 years ago. So that's, it's an amazing way of how you can invest money and at the same time meet, you know, meet your customers' needs. And then um, one of the other things that for Fortune Magazine has this thing where they call, you know, most admired companies and now for seven, actually now eight, for eight years in a row, we've actually uh, been in the world's most admired company. So something I'm really proud of. And we're also uh, for eight years in, there's another magazine, I can't remember where it was, but it's the, one of the world's most ethical companies. So some of the things that we're really proud of as we continue to drive our, our growth. So let me talk a little bit about Florida. We're in 35 counties, uh, 9,000 employees. And that's significant because about 10 years ago, we had 12,000 employees. So we've almost tripled our customer base. And at the same time, we've been uh, reducing our, our employee base. Obviously, you can't do that without technology. You can't do that without process change. And some of that technology you'll see later is how we continue to modernize our fleet. We've got about 74,000 miles of power lines. And as I mentioned, you know, we have a pretty significant customer base. The relevance of this slide is only as good as what this slide was 10 years ago. So we're now about a 70% natural gas company here in the state of Florida. And as Professor uh, Maine spoke about, we've got, um, We've got a challenge that we don't, we don't have a renewable portfolio standard in the state. We don't have any real legislative policies that, that uh, really push for wind and solar. But by the same token, we also have some technology challenges and we have some resource challenges. We're not the best state for wind. Good morning, Jana. We're not the best state for, for wind. You know, unfortunately, when the wind blows, it blows in the summer and it blows very hard and that's not good. So. Um, Solar is really kind of the natural fit for renewable energy. There is a niche market also for biomass. But solar's got its challenges here in the state of Florida. Obviously, the, uh, the wind loading is a, is a real challenge for us, right? And especially us, we're South Florida. Um, so you've got to meet some pretty significant wind loading issues. And obviously, we're, even though we're the sunshine state, we've got a lot of cloud coverage. So from, a, from an engineering challenge, it's not so much the cloud coverage, it's the constant cloud coming in, coming out. And we've had a lot of experiences with that now with our solar thermal project, which is a 75 megawatt project, which are the, it's not PV, it's mirrors. So that, we've, we've had some painful lessons uh, on that technology. So as you can see, we're, we're predominantly natural gas, and then nuclear, we had a We'll talk a little bit about the upgrades, but we, we had an upgrade of 500 megawatts in the last couple of years, which since there hasn't been any new nuclear built in the United States since, since the 70s, but we were able to get an additional 250 megawatts each at both Turkey Point and St. Lucie. So that was a pretty significant accomplishment. So this is what I was talking about. So despite all the capital investment, the infrastructure betterments, and the modernization of a lot of our generation fleet, you can see that our rates are, are very low. We're at $95. For this is for 1,000 kilowatt hours. The average rate in the state's about 122, and nationally we're about 25% lower the, than the national average. And obviously a lot of that has to do with the cost of natural gas, which is, you know, very low. So uh, we've, we've got the, we've got, we've been fortunate that our executive team had the foresight a few years ago to be able to begin driving that investment because you know, there was a time when natural gas was at $14 MMBTU. <laughs> so you would have been an idiot. Uh, today, if I'd be standing in front of you, you'd, have, you'd be seeing the highest cost. 
So today, I, you know, it, we're able to say, okay, because we're at three dollars or three dollars and fifty cents natural gas, and we're hedged, it allows us to be able to offer these competitive rates. So sometimes we take granted for granted what what happens in the uh, in this space. So when we go in for a rate case. We get bashed, we, uh, we're the villains, we're the bad guys, the media loves to attack us. We've got politicians saying, not a penny more, you know. Um, let me tell you what's really happened with our rates. So, since, uh, since 2008, this is what the consumer price index has demonstrated for these type of markets, right? So the food industry, when you, which I, I, I thought actually would be higher than this, but have you looked at a carton of eggs lately and price of milk lately and the price of you know, fruits? Well, it's actually a 13% increase from 08 to 013. When you look at gasoline, 15%, although to the driving up, it was like $3.80 a gallon. So I think that's dated because I think this was at 350 a gallon. Now, medical care is without Obamacare. <laughs> So I can tell you that just, um, I'm not gonna make political uh, news here, but um, just in our company alone, we've, we, ha we had about a $16 million increase and we're self-funded, we're self-insured. So to, uh, to comply with some of these things, it's been an amazing hit to our bottom line. So it puts a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on your employee costs. So for us to be able to keep our rates at a competitive level, anytime there's a hiccup, in our purchase of gas or our purchase of commodities or our purchase of medical, whatever, it's a, we have to adjust our costs. And unfortunately, in, some, in many cases, it's the employee. So while all this has been going on, our typical customer bill has gone down 10%. That's, so when you hear the media basically bashing energy costs and what have you, I mean, I get pretty defensive about it. I say, guys, take a look at what's going on when, you know, well, our costs have gone up. Yeah, well, your, consume, your usage has gone up, too. So every house has plasma TVs, every house has computers, every house has electronic equipment, alarm systems, all kinds of stuff. And in, in Florida, most people have you know, pools and pool pumps and what have you. So this is what's been going on with our grid. I know the professor talked about some of the things and some of the challenges. We, we are bullish on this whole thing. We're, we've invested about $15 billion in the grid. So the grid for us is, you know, obviously you hear a lot of people talk about the grid is antiquated, the grid is, you know, something from yesterday. Well, we, our grid is pretty new and, and some of that was because five individuals, Wilma, Francis, Jean, and a few others that basically, the hurricanes that came in 04, 05, 06 that basically, um, in most cases, we had to reconstruct and basically rebuild a brand new system. We didn't have to just, you know, people say, oh, you, you know, you got to go out there and, and fix it. Well, you, you had to rebuild it. Everything was basically devastated. So that also allowed us to put in a tremendous amount of what we call uh, storm hardening. Um, when you drive around South Florida, you see in many, in many locations where you're, we're replacing, we're basically trying to replace every wooden pole in the system with concrete pole. And, uh, and even at that, when Wilma came across the state, every transmission, uh, a lot of those transmission fixers are on State Road 80 that go from Fort Myers to, to uh, Palm Beach were cut in half. Those were, those were concrete poles. So, um, but part of what we're doing is also getting smarter. So a lot of, a lot of investment in smart grid technology. We've actually implemented, our, all of our customers now have smart, smart meters. So we've implemented 4.5 million smart meters. Now there are people that still are very opposed to smart meters. So we had to, in essence, go to the Public Service Commission and we have to have an opt-out clause. So people who don't want a smart meter because of the perception that the government's spying on them, you have to actually make accommodations for that. So, which is not easy when you're trying to build a smart system. <laughs> So this is basically what, what I was talking about. So we've got a number of different devices. When we talk about intelligent devices, it's basically sensoring, it's mostly mo you know, monitoring devices, both on the transmission, on the distribution, and obviously on consumer appliances. So we've got the smart grid, and then the ability hopefully to begin to have smarter sensoring. Uh, we're actually doing a huge pilot down in South Florida where we're implementing a tremendous amount of uh, 
through Silver Springs networking a tremendous amount of smart capacity in our system. We've also um, deployed in some cases some, some pilots where we have the street lights, the street light solar, but the street light solar is more than that. It's, it's a monitoring and a sensoring device that allows you to communicate with the street lights. In most cases, Pete, we, we never knew when the street lights were out until a customer called us. So this allows us to get real-time information. Because I don't know if, if you know this, but utilities get sued when street lights are out. So street lights are out, there's an accident, utilities get sued. Um, and in many neighborhoods, they shoot out the lights, they have an accident, a deliberate accident, and they sue the utilities. So when we talk, when we go in to try to get reform, tort reform, to be able to get these frivolous lawsuits, that's what it's all about, is people deliberately causing, a, you know, incidents like that to be able to sue the utilities, the deep pockets. Um, this is an area that we've been basically uh, studying. Um, this, is, this might sound wrong, but we, we, we found that in many of our energy efficient systems, many of the pilots that we've been doing with the state, they have been inefficient. And a lot of the subsidies that we put in for solar, a lot of the solar rebates that were put in back in the 08 period, really don't pass the, what we call the RIM test, which is our economic test. So let me give you an example. When we do a rebate, what happens is you, you allocate a certain amount of money. And then it's first come, first serve. So the first X amount of people go in, get a rebate, and they get, in essence, a subsidy on their solar installation. You three guys win, so you get solar on your roof. You guys are paying for their, their solar. So it's a fairness issue, right? So um, basically what's happened in the state is a number of folks have basically gotten a lot of subsidies at the expense of the rest of our customers. So the rest of our customers are going, hey, well, why am I paying for my neighbors? So I think that whole thing needs to be reassessed. You're starting to hear a lot of rumbling all over the United States on a, a, a phenomenon called net metering, which is a very sensitive issue. It puts utilities in a very awkward position. <laughs> so basically what net metering is, is if it costs me three pennies to produce power at FPO. I got nuclear and I got gas and I got some solar. So it costs me about three pennies. When, when someone puts solar on their roof, I pay them the retail rate. So I'm paying you 11 cents or 10 cents. All right, so even though it could have cost me three pennies to service you, I'm paying you that whole, that I'm paying you retail. Guess who's paying for that retail? The customers that don't have solar. So those are the issues that are being debated all over the country right now. And in some areas, I think Arizona, I think North Carolina, the utilities have basically gone out and trying to put a tariff on people that are using solar because they're saying, hey, they're basically getting the benefit of using our grid to be able to put their solar. So when the professor talked about earlier, we desperately need energy policies in this country. <laughs> we def desperately need a real healthy debate about how all this stuff that's coming into uh, the grid, the uh, distributed generation, all those components fit because, you know, it's real and it's here. And there's, in California, for example, 33% of the energy is coming from renewable energy. That's huge. And that, you know, that's come in the last five years. It's been a real phenomenon. And it's going to continue to, to make sense because cost of solar has really come down rapidly. We have over $10 billion invested in wind in the United States. And when we started in the wind business, we were getting capacity factors of 18 to 20 percent. In some areas, we're getting 40 percent. We're getting 50 percent. Where our costs are below, are, are below what I would call the blended cost of coal, gas in some of these areas. So it's a phenomenon that's here. Now obviously the challenge with wind is we, we've got, in many cases, the, the generation is very far from the load. So we have to build transmission. So we've created our own transmission company. Uh, we started with a company called Lone Star Transmission in Texas. Now we've expanded that. Now we're, it's U.S. transmission. So we're building transmission because the utilities didn't want to build transmission lines to service the load. 
So that's, that's a phenomenon you're going to see more and more of. And it's a, it's a healthy debate. It's a debate that needs to be had. And um, you're going to see some real horses get into this race, uh, especially the distributed generation race. I would argue that you're going to see utilities eventually get back into this race. I don't think the utilities are just going to basically abandon a lot of load. So this is what we're, this is what, when I was talking about strengthening the grid, this is $460 million to, to harden the grid. So a lot of that is basically hardening the system with the poles. I mean, basically taking out a lot of wooden poles, putting in heavy duty, um, strengthened concrete poles. A lot of these concrete poles um, have gotten a lot better. They were, they were hollow. That's why they would snap. And then I don't, We've, we've really positioned ourselves well, not because uh, we wanted to, but because of need. We, we've, we're kind of the company that has uh, a lot of track record, a lot of traction on how to restore power in the event of adverse weather conditions. So, for example, we now have an agreement with all the other utilities where we're, we're kind of first responders. Uh, this year we had Arkansas first response. We had, obviously, Sandy a couple years ago. We sent a lot of crews up there. Uh, this year, Georgia was getting hammered. I mean, we, we sent a lot of crews up to Georgia. So it's allowed us to learn a lot. I think Sandy was one of those hurricanes that uh, the, it was not just the wind, it was the intensity of the wind. And it, it caused so much incredible damage up there as well as the flooding. So we've got, um, we typically have over 500 uh, crews ready to go at any given time. And, and that's the agreement. Now, being in the peninsula, obviously, it takes a little time to deploy because you have to, you know, you have to basically get these guys out of Florida, but you got to keep them out of harm's way, too. So, but they, they got to be able to respond, but they, at the same time, they got to be, they got to be able to do it in a safe manner and a quick manner. And for our guys who had never been accustomed to working in snow conditions and icy conditions, they're getting a lot of exposure now. So this is... Um, Something we're real proud of is our, our emissions record. So when you, when you see what we're doing on the generation fleet, and I'll show you some of the events that we've, we've taken on, you can see what we're doing on the, on the emissions. So your, your carbon dioxide emissions, your nit nitric oxide emissions, I mean, this is across the board. We compare ourselves constantly with a balanced scorecard on cost, on our cleanliness, and our reliability. And, and these are things we're very proud of, obviously. So this is my favorite slide of all. So when you look at, in 2001, we were importing over 40 million barrels of oil at FPL. Today we're down to less than 1 million barrel, barrels of oil. We have, in essence, weaned off foreign oil, totally. That's something we should be proud of. So when people, when people talk about how do you how do you begin to become um, energy independent? I think the real challenge is really the transportation sector. The, you know, at least for us, we basically, we're weaned off foreign oil. And a lot of that is the advent of the whole natural gas phenomenon that's taking place in the United States. But um, I do talk to a lot of folks that are not only investing in the whole um, electric, car ve uh, electric vehicle scenario, but they're also investing in natural gas vehicles. There was a legislation passed last year which actually encourages a lot of the natural gas phenomenon, a lot of the natural gas infrastructure in the state of Florida for, for vehicles. So I think you're going to see a real debate going on between you know, natural gas vehicles as well, and then electric vehicles. And that's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. But this is an amazing slide. And we've done calculations where we said if every utility in the United States had this same type of profile, the emission reductions in the U.S. would be insane. I mean, incredible. Um, not to mention having to buy oil from Venezuela or Saudi Arabia or any, you know, most of these countries that we don't really get along very well with, right? You know, we, we hire, this is, a, this is amazing, but we, we hire a number of veterans that come back from the Iraqi wars and the Afghanistan wars. A lot of these guys are in the wind development business. And the reason for that is they're so passionate about getting off foreign oil. These guys, when they were overseas, see a lot. And they question why we're doing what we're doing. When you're losing a number of, you know, friends, family to, to wars that are caused by the need for oil, in many cases, they're passionate about building an infrastructure that requires 
basically zero fossil fuel. So it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. This is what we're doing now. We've got basically two pipelines that today provide all the natural gas for us in the state of Florida. And we're the largest purchaser and user of natural gas in the United States in the utility business. So basically we, we felt that in order to mitigate that risk, because both pipelines were coming from the Gulf of Mexico, so in order to mitigate that risk, we're pushing for a third pipeline. This is a pipeline that would, the genesis would be in Alabama. And that, that pipeline would be owned by a company called Spectra. And then we're gonna take ownership somewhere in the state um, and make that, you know, make our hub down at Martin County. Martin County is where we have a 3,600 megawatt natural gas plant. And then we got new plants in Cape Canaveral, Riviera. So this is critical for us in the state. And as, as you see some of the other utilities like Tico and Progress begin to change their, their portfolio, change more to natural gas, this is gonna be a necessity. So a couple, well, 2008, 2009 timeframe, we, um, we started on a mission that basically said, okay, why don't we take advantage of our existing infrastructure and, and how do we begin to change and upgrade that infrastructure? So we had, we had vintage plants that were like 1960s type plants, mostly oil. So we went ahead and, and, and pushed for a public service regulatory approval that would allow us to take our Cape Canaveral plant and our Riviera plant, decommission, basically demolish them, right? And convert that to a natural gas plant. So when you got a 10,500 heat rate and you make that about a 6,500 heat rate, you get about a 33% more fuel efficiency. You get about an 88% betterment on your particulate emission profile. You use the same you know, transmission infrastructure, the water infrastructure that was there. So it, you can do it fairly cheap. So these projects were about um, 1,000 megawatts and they came in at about a billion dollars. So it's tough to beat. It's tough to beat those prices. Not only that, they create, in during peak construction, they created over, I think, 1,500 jobs in these locations. So it was a nice boom for that infrastructure. And then it obviously it creates a lot of nice tax revenue for the counties and the cities, especially, well, Cape Canaveral, which was devastated by the whole NASA issue. It, would, it was nice to get some nice tax revenue in there. This is Riviera. Uh, we're actually commissioning Riviera uh, next, well, actually April 10th. So these, it's a twin project. Basically, we did the same thing. We, we tore down the old plant. Uh, this is gonna have a heat rate of about 6450. And again, it's gonna give you the same type of efficiencies. It gave first year revenues for, that, for this city. It's a pretty impoverished city. It's $20 million. That goes into the education fund, police officers, firefighters, those kind of things. So it's a, this is a real win-win-win, actually. So this is um, basically ready to go. We're going to commission it in two weeks. Um, we knocked this thing down uh, on Father's Day two years ago. And uh, as far as you could see on the intercoastal on both sides, there were boats. <laughs> It took a year of planning, it took 7.2 seconds to knock it down. <laughs> I was like, that's it? <laughs> but uh, I, I happened to be media boy for that event. And uh, so you're on the top of the, you're at the top of the Port Authority building. And uh, at, at 6.45 in the morning, it was, uh, it's like 89 degrees. Um, and the people had camped out at a little island across the uh, intercoastal and you could start to see the lights coming on and the little tents and stuff at like six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a, I wish I had pictures, but as far as, far as you could see on the intercoastal on both sides, it was amazing. And then what, what you, when you do these things, um, people don't realize the coordination, the amount of coordination that it takes. So we just knocked down Port Everglades. If you've ever flown into Fort Lauderdale Airport, you see four humongous, you used to see four humongous stacks. Well, you got an airport, you got a port where you have a, you know, a bazillion cruise ships going out every minute of the day, 
you've got major hubs there, so you have to coordinate, I, I can't remember how many agencies, but between Homeland Security, FBI, CIA, Sheriff's Department, local police authority, Port Authority, you have to basically stop air traffic in that area for, I think it's like 10 minutes. The cruise ships are like not happy, right, because all that dust. So you got to figure out where the wind's blowing. Um, the beauty on this day was we, we knocked this thing down at 6 a.m. And, and uh, what, was, it, you know, what was amazing was it rained, it just an amazing, just a tremendous rainstorm that was like from 3 a.m. to about 5.30 a.m. We knocked this thing down at 6, and at 6.05 it started pouring again. So it was like um, all the dust, pew. so basically the cruise ships were pretty ecstatic. Um, but this was even more intense because it was, a very, it was a very narrow area, a lot of transmission in this area. Um, so this one, we're, we're anticipating this is going to go commercial 2016. And uh, the same kind of, the same kind of uh, perspective. I think the, the heat rate on this one's actually going to be even lower. It's, uh, these are Siemens. We were using Siemens H turbines. This is going to be probably the next generation, the J or whatever they. So um, real proud of this effort because this is, this is, you know, between Miami and Fort Lauderdale, this is really where the hub of our infrastructure is. This is another gigawatt? Mm -hmm. This uh, another. Uh, this was another. You know, really used a lot of oil. It was a very inefficient plant, but we could not. You know, we couldn't take it offline because a lot of our load is right there, centered in you know, Lauderdale and, and Dade. So, for every time you have to shut some of this stuff down, we have a lot of peakers in the area that we have to basically quick. You know, ramp up. So, this was a, a, a major, a major challenge for us. While this was going on, we ramped up 500 megawatts, and this was about you know this was about a billion dollars of economic impact. You know, nuclear and anything you do in nuclear is huge scale stuff. So 500 megawatts of nuclear. The beauty of nuclear is that there's no there's no fuel purchase for the next 30 or 40 years. So there's an upfront capital cost, but then the the operation and maintenance of it significantly should be should significantly cheaper than fossil. So very proud of that. A um, lot of a lot of tax revenues. A lot of people got put to work. So there's there's some tremendous significance on economic benefits for these projects. So talking about solar or not, <laughs> um, I had the uh, I had the the real privilege of working on our first three solar projects, and we we really anticipated at that time that we'd be building a lot of solar in the state of Florida. So in 2008, there was a vision that basically called for a 20% by 2020, those kind of things. So we um, quickly jumped out there. There was a provision by the legislature that said, you're allowed to build 110 megawatts, first come, first serve. We put in three projects right away. We were actually obnoxious about it. We actually filed before the actual filing date. <laughs> and we said, we're ready to go. We've got three projects. Uh, one was in DeSoto County, which was, um, We've got 13,000 acres in DeSoto County, and we, we envisioned that one day we were going to build a, a nuclear plant there. Obviously, when we went to talk to the commissioners, the first thing they said, we're not building nuclear, right? So no, not yet. Um, there's no water in DeSoto. The Peace River was basically, at that time, they had been going through years of droughts. So this worked out nice. It was a small project. I mean, it's 25 megawatts. At that time, it was, one of, it was the largest PV facility in the country. And uh, we actually had the President of the United States come in and commission the plant. Um, it's actually running really nice, but it's 25 megawatts. And then we did a private-public partnership with NASA, and that was a 10 megawatt plant where we leased their facility. And in, in basically, it's the old barter system. In lieu of receiving cash payments for a lease, they asked if we would um, not give them cash, and we were like stunned. I said, "You don't want cash for a lease." And the reason they didn't want cash is if you give if you give cash to the to the um, Kennedy Space Center, the money goes directly to Washington. So what we did was we built them their own facility. So we basically said we took the present value of a 30-year lease, 
and we said we'll build you a one megawatt facility and we'll do the operation and maintenance for, for 30 years. So that was kind of a really neat project. And we were able to, kind of cool, we, we got to work with a NASA's intellectual capacity. They've been doing solar in space for over 30 years, so it was kind of good lessons learned. And then we, um, we did our big hybrid project. So the big hybrid project was we, we decided to build a 75 megawatt solar thermal project, the mirrors, and combine that with one of our existing gas plants over at Martin. So that was the first of its kind. I think it's, I think there's another one maybe in Morocco or something like that's been built. So we, we knew we had the expertise because we've operated solar thermal projects in California for years, uh, actually since the 80s. Uh, using the old Israeli technology. So now we combined it with our natural gas facility. We had some major hiccups the first year. We had, a, we had a leak. What happens is you basically have these mirrors and then you have a tube. The, the mirrors reflect the sunlight onto the tubes, which is an oil derivative. It heats up and then goes into the you know, same uh, heat exchanger, creates steam, those kind of things. So we had a leak, so we had to deal with that. Uh, the biggest challenge we had was the constant ramping up and ramping down due to cloud coverage. That was brutal. Um, and uh, I think going forward, I don't think we'd build these in Florida again. We would build it in California, we would build it in Arizona, but I don't think we'd build it in Florida. Brutal on the grid or brutal to the machinery? <laughs> yeah, so... Um, Brutal to having to report, brutal to maintain it, brutal to operate it on a reliable basis because anytime there's a, anytime you have to shut down the gas unit for maintenance, it shuts down the solar project. So it affects your, your performance. Anytime there's cloud coverage, you're talking about ramping down 75 megawatts ASAP, having to ramp up 75 megawatts on your gas. So when you're, when you're in the desert, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great story and you don't have those kind of hiccups all day. But here with the amount of cloud coverage, it's a, it's a real challenge. So we've, the good news is we've been able to adapt and we've been able to engineer a number of things that are gonna help us going forward. But when we built the solar project, the solar thermal project, the cost of thermal was actually cheaper than PV. Now, PV is incredibly cheap. So. We built, when we built the Soto, it was $6 a watt, which is very expensive. But that was the first of its kind of that size. And this one came in at about $4, $4 a watt, the, uh, the, the hybrid. Today, I could probably build the Soto for a buck fifty a watt. So it's, it's really getting cheap. So we just got quotes on some rooftop commercial space at $3.50 a watt. Those used to be like $10 a watt. So you're starting to see you know, significant uh, ramping down. My fear is though, is that we've basically given this whole market to China. So there was a time when we were really excited about, well, at least you can create an industry here, jobs in Florida, economic development in Florida, bringing in a hub, bringing in technology, manufacturing, distribution, bringing in the whole engineering base. We had companies that were gonna bring their whole engineering and design from California, trying to build a hub here. I was pushing hard to get a whole clean energy industry here and uh, never materialized. The Germans, who were kind of pioneering the whole solar movement, they basically given their whole industry, their whole manufacturing industry to China too. So um, we, we've lost it. And I don't know if we can get it back. I really don't know if we can get it back. Um, so that's, that's somewhat demoralizing. Um, but with the advent of, with the advent of, of solar technology and the cost coming down so much, I think, there's gonna be huge opportunities. I was just down in the Dominican Republic presenting to their government. Their, uh, the, the rate of theft, meaning the amount of energy that is not paid for, collected by the utilities, is 40%. Now the people paying for that are the people that are already paying for theirs and now they're paying for everybody else's. That's not sustainable. Their outages are insane. They, they have four or five hours a day of outages. I mean, it's crazy. They're, they're, they're paying over 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Where here in the United States, you know, you're paying nine. So I think there's a tremendous, for, for, there's gonna be a tremendous opportunity for companies that wanna take the risk of going into the Caribbean, Central and South America. Um, you know, I don't know, 
I don't know how you insure it necessarily, but there's ways, uh, you know, if you can do that, then you can build huge hubs here in South Florida and become the exporter of a lot of this stuff, just like we can begin to export natural gas at some point here soon. These, these are some of the projects, you know, mostly on a, on a research side. We, we're deploying over, uh, we're deploying solar to over 100 schools. We just do that. Um, it's part of our, it's part of our foundation. Um, the beauty of that is beginning to, to educate children and force the issue at home, right? So you begin to educate children on how clean energy works. The, the thought is they take that argument down, they take that debate down to the dinner table. Their parents are, are then forced to say, oh, that, tell me what you've been doing. And the parents don't know anything about it. So the kids are actually educating the parents on wind technology, solar technology. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And then we put a kiosk at each of these schools, which shows the kids how much energy, how much emissions they're, they're uh, reducing. And then, you know, you put it into their terms, like, for example, how many cars are basically being equivalent to how many cars are being taken off the road. So it's, we do events with the kids. So uh, we're, we're, you know, they're learning a lot. We're, at our Juno facility in, in Palm Beach, we've got uh, six solar installations on our roof. We're constantly changing out uh, some of those panels, assessing those panels. They're all connected to smart meters. We've got two big uh, solar covered parking canopies. Each of those have a number of electric vehicle charging stations attached to them. So we've got a, you know, it's basically our own little, little living lab. And then one of, one of the things that we are doing is um, this governor, uh, Governor Scott, has been bullish on the whole issue of economic development. He is the economic development guy for the state. So he goes on all these trade missions. And one of the things they encourage us to do is um, create kind of an economic development perspective. So we've got a small group of folks that works with Enterprise Florida. And they're, all, they're going out trying to encourage companies to move to Florida. So what we do is we offer a rider that basically says if you use so much, if you use so much electricity or, and you employ so many people, we're going to give you huge discounts on your energy bill for the first five years. So we just, we just landed Hertz. I think Hertz is moving over to uh, Fort Myers. And these are some of the companies that are um, coming here to Florida or actually come to Florida. So it's, it's pretty neat. It's uh, an opportunity to use energy as an economic development driver for the state, try to encourage new business, encourage new employment. So um, stay tuned for that. There'll probably, there's going to be more, more economic development innovation on that. That's it. We're uh, a, lot, a lot to digest. <laughs> Questions? I'm sure you guys go. No, it's not. Yes. We haven't. Um, I don't think we changed our, our pricing structure. Obviously, it was a significant investment. Um, but what we're doing is it's really more. It's really more geared towards customer usage. So the. I think the challenge will be the, the price drop, if there is a drop, will not be based on the utilities technology. It'll be based on how the customer educates themselves to be able to use that technology. So if I know that at X amount of, you know, at X amount of time during the day, I can, I can be more efficient with my dryer, my pool pumps, all those kind of things, I'll be able to have intellectual debate with, with, my, with my, in essence, appliances. So today, I can, I can go on my iPhone and program my whole house. My thermostats, everything. So I don't, I don't think it's a matter of how we're going to be able to use it. It's going to be how the customer is going to be able to use it to, to drop their rates. So it's going to be interesting. We don't have, you know, part of the problem is we don't have enough re renewable energy yet to be able to, to be able to, to do the things that I think is what you're really getting at, which is, if I know that I got six hours of sun today, and I'm using a distributed system, then I can really program my house whereby my electric bill is going to be, but because we don't, you know, we, I think we have 24 megawatts of solar, uh, distributed solar in the state of Florida. Not a lot. Good question. Great question. Can you assign the on-call program? Yeah, I, I think what we were trying to, 
what we were trying to achieve is when you have those brutally hot days, when you have, you're, you're really stressed for demand. I mean, we're really stressed for uh, the ability to meet load. It gives us the ability to basically shut people's appliances down for a while. So pool pumps predominantly. So what we were hoping is that we would have more flexibility in being able to avoid brownouts. And uh, I mean, it, I think it, you know, the consumers are getting smarter. So it, uh, when you look at the efficiency of it, I think we don't really have, we don't use it much. The danger is, is that these energy efficiency programs are used to, in essence, count towards the reserve margin of the state. And that's dangerous. So by, by that I mean we have a 20% reserve margin in the state. That basically says you, have, you should have 20% more energy available than you, than, you, than you need, theoretically. But you're always ramping up and down power plants and what have you. So if you truly get into a situation where you are, you're experiencing these 95 degree heat waves and everybody's locking into their ACs, you can't expect everybody to turn their energy efficiency stuff on or allow us to turn it all off and use that to be able to offset that load. So I think part of the debate that's going to be going on in Tallahassee is what's really, what's really the right so, um, margin and, and, and should it be comprised of generation load or should it be comprised of energy efficiency? And that's going to be a very interesting debate because, because we don't have a lot of distributed generation. We can't depend on the people to be able to be leveraging their their soul. So it's based on us to be able to have to provide all that load. So it's gone. I, I was I was curious if you would consider it cost effective that program. We we don't we haven't seen the cost effectiveness. Before, uh, further consideration of the do the consumers in the program get paid just for signing up or do they only get paid when they no, they get paid. They get, no, they get paid for signing up. I think they get like a, I don't know what it is, the credit on your bill. It's, uh, I, I, it's not like a, yeah, it's like 10 bucks a month or something like that. So, so in essence, it's basically you're, you're allowing me to curtail your, your power as needed. But for 10 bucks, you know, I do it. Because <laughs> I'm not home during the day when they shut it off. So. But if you're, you know, if you're working from your home and stuff, I wouldn't suggest it because I mean they can just shut your your, your system down at two o'clock in the afternoon. It's not working. I had a question about the net metering and the cross subsidization. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to follow Arizona Public Service some of the other other companies that are wanting to do something. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah. Um, I think how is that different than you know economic development writers? You were just talking about the economic development writers. Yeah. Um, that's I think I think the difference is when you're when you're the thought is the theory is that when you're you're bringing in new companies into the state, you're creating economic development for the whole state. So everybody benefits because your tax revenues should be better. You're you're hoping to get more people. Restaurants are going to boom. Your you know property taxes will be able to be kept flat. Where the other one is just you versus him. You're paying for his solar, or he's paying for your solar. So it's a, it you're not you're not creating economic wealth for the state of Florida through a net metering policy, but through an economic development policy, you are. You're definitely creating wealth because you're encouraging more people to come down here. More people are paying taxes. You're you're hopefully creating capital improvements. So it's to me, it's pretty pretty different. I think it could. Um, I think it could. I think what has to happen is the what I see as the bigger issue is how do you how do you price the value of solar? So today, I don't give any value to solar. Meaning, if I go, when I go to my economic dispatching guys and I say, hey, I want to build whatever 100 megawatt solar facility. I have to run a model that basically says, what is the, the, not to make it overly analytical, but what is the cumulative present value of what they call our revenue requirements? Meaning, if I do X, is it going to cost my customers more or is it going to cost less? 
So when I build this natural gas project, each of those projects saves my customers over the life of the asset about $600 million. Because the price of gas is significantly different than the price of the current project. So it, it's a negative, which is a good thing. When I build solar, they don't give me any value for emission reductions. They don't give me any value for capacity. They give me as, they, they give me as available energy. That's it. So today it costs my customers money. So my, my, my cumulative present value revenue requirements when I build solar is a positive, which, is a, which means it's bad. I mean, I have to collect money from the general population of my customers to be able to fund it. So that's the issue. And the debate that's going on is, on the distributed side, should you be giving some value to solar? Should you be giving some firmness to it, meaning can I depend on it? And in Florida, my guys won't let me do that because I, when I, the question they ask me is, today it's uh, whatever, March 28th. Let's assume September 25, I want to do a forward contract and you guarantee me those 100 megawatts will be available to you. I said, I can't. It's middle of the rainy season, first of all, but I mean, I can't do that. If I was in Arizona, I would be 85 to 90% confident that I would be able to guarantee that for you. So I I'd be willing to give you what they call a capacity payment. So a capacity means I'm paying you for the insurance, the confidence that I'm going to have that power available to you. Energy says I'm only going to pay you when, that, when I'm actually producing kilowatt hours. So it's, um, the other argument is should we be giving solar a value for not having to build more transmission and more distribution, which is a capital requirement to the state? And in Minnesota, I think they're actually given a penny, a penny and a half. So if, you're, if your cost of electricity is three pennies and solar is 12, all of a sudden I just reduced it by one. So somewhere there might be a happy medium where maybe I don't pay you 12 cents on the net metering, maybe I pay you six cents or seven cents, but begin to have some kind of a compromise between the utilities and the distributed generation guys. The other issue is more the economic issue, not the technical issue, which says if, if you truly believe that this is the auto industry, the buggy whip industry, the auto industry kind of analysis that says ultimately a death spiral because if, if more and more people go to a distributed system, the rest of the customers that are not using it are having to fund all of the infrastructure for the state, which is not sustainable, right? So if today, if it's 10 of us today share a, share a pizza, we're dividing that cost of the pizza by 10. But tomorrow, two of our guys drop out, now eight of us are paying for the pizza, and then tomorrow two more drop out, now six. So at what point does the remaining population that isn't on distributed generation having to pay for all of the infrastructure, all the embedded costs? That's going to be a real challenge. Because if today everybody's paying 94 bucks, then tomorrow I have that 94 becomes 120 or 150 because I have less people right, paying for that infrastructure. That's going to be, that's going to be a, a, a challenge. So it's, look, there's, Washington has been so absent on the energy policy debate. It's, it's, it's terrifying. There's no debate. So, you know, we're still doing, we're still analyzing stuff that was 20, 30 years old. There's no, there's no real analytical analysis going on at the, at the state level, so at the federal level. Um, so you've got all these brilliant people, like your engineering departments here, you've got, I'm the chairman of the Florida Solar Energy Center. I'm the chairman of FESC, the Florida Energy Center. So we've got all these brilliant people working on all this stuff, and then you've got politicians. And they want one sound bite. So their sound bite for the last four years was not a penny more. I, I, don't, I would never charge my consumers a penny more. Really? <laughs> you do it for a lot of other stuff. So, so that's the challenge. I mean, if I if 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 I'm running for state office, I'm running for the accountant's job or the controller's job, and my opponent says so and so raised your energy bills. That's when you have an art population that basically people on fixed income, they get very nervous about that. And that's, that's part of the challenge. And you know, Jana's been through this debate so many times. I mean, it's, it's very frustrating. One last question. Yeah. yeah, so let's look at the challenge of uh, another recall, which is the plug-in electric vehicles. Yes. I realize it's not 
widely dis uh, popular yet, but there's a lot of research going on to how that's going to affect the grid in general, and then if you're charging at home, if you're charging somewhere else. So can you talk to that? And also, yeah. a wrinkle in that is the thing called, uh, I guess it's sub in terms of how your costing or the billing around that and right. how that ties into revenue grade building. Can you talk about how yeah. that's impacting FPL? I'm a big fan, obviously, of uh, electric vehicles. I'm a big fan of, of figuring out a way to proliferate this stuff because um, that slide that I was able to show you that said 40 million barrels of oil to one, you can't, you can't impact this country unless you do that with the transportation sector. So um, I think the, you know, for us, it's, uh, we've got a number of, we, our whole fleet is either biodiesel, biofuel, or electric vehicles. Even our, even our bucket trucks are all, we're actually starting to burn some biofuel into our power plants now. So the challenge for us is when you get enough proliferation, and I know Orlando had a big rally around the whole electrification of the whole EV, so they brought in the uh, federal government, they brought in the, the parks, the electric vehicles, they brought in the uh, rental vehicle cars. We, we got to figure a way to get the cost down. And I've been reading a lot about the battery costs are really going to be, in, by 2020, the battery costs are going to be significantly lower. I think that's going to trigger kind of an explosive reaction on this market. Once that happens, um, basically what will happen is all of, your, all of your vehicles are power plants. So we're already doing a tremendous amount of customer pilot works where we actually uh, have a number of demos. We set up at somebody's house. We put in the plugs. And then we monitor um, in our diagnostic. We have a diagnostic center at FPO that monitors all of our power plants all over the country on real-time basis. So we're going to tag all that into our diagnostic center. Um, the issue for us is our peak is a little different than most peaks. So our peak is a summer peak. So w the, the real beauty of it is, so if I charge my vehicle at night, I, if I charge my vehicle at night, I go to work. FPL pays me a stipend to be able to use those batteries at peak during the day. How do I drive home? Um, you know, what we, <laughs> so because our peak is a summer peak, a noon peak, it's going to be a real challenge how we're able to, to integrate the consumption versus, you know, the, the need. So that's um, a little different for California, obviously a little different for other states where they can actually most of their peak is a nighttime peak or a winter peak. So it'll be, it'll be very interesting. But what you're talking about is really the holy grail of the next uh, few years, which is how do we begin to tap this market and begin to use our vehicles as a means to supply storage to all of our solar in the system? And then how do the customers, in essence, use that uh, to be able to offset their energy bill? Because if the utility is paying you to use your batteries, I'm offsetting my energy bill. Um, how it will affect pricing, I don't know. Um, we, we're what, we don't have time of use in the state of Florida, so we don't have different pricing models, but California does. And, uh, you know, the, part of the problem, too, is California has done a miserable job of, even though, they're, even though they've done a great job of proliferating renewable energy, what's happened is the cost of electricity in the state of California is like 15 or 16 cents a kilowatt hour versus our 9 or 10. So they haven't done a good job of, of keeping the cost down. That's the, excuse me, that's the end price to, to the consumers? Here? Yeah. It's between 9 and 10. Very cheap. Yeah. But, so let me give you a, let me give you something that will really torque you off. So, in Germany where we, you hear all these wonderful stories about solar and how they use 20%. Can I tell you that their emission rate today is higher than when they started the solar program? That's disgusting, by the way. Talk about so you can build all the solar you want and have a horrible plan because if you if you don't if your engineers aren't involved in the planning and the integration of all this technology, so what they've had to do is build coal plants. They've had to build coal plants because the solar isn't very effective. So their emission profile is significantly worse than what it was 20 years ago. Sad.